have not heard of NEMO yet, we are the network of European museum organizations connecting national museum associations as well as uh, individual museums and interest groups from 40 countries. Being an ever-growing network, so far we count over 19 members. NEMO represents over 30,000 museums across Europe towards policy makers on national and EU level. Furthermore, we share knowledge and train museum professionals through our uh, learning exchanges, our training courses and our webinars, which are free of charge for our members. Um, usually we host three to four webinars per year, facilitated by different museum experts in Europe about diverse topics in the museum field. We are glad that the European Year of Culture and Heritage 2018 is in full speed. But one aspect that seems to be forget, forgotten is difficult heritage. Therefore, we are very glad to welcome Jonathan Eaton and Miriam Lakti from the non-profit organization Cultural Heritage Without Borders Albania today. They will present us their dialogue-based based approach to museum planning at sites associated with a difficult past by showing different methods for setting up a dialogue, engaging different stakeholders. Jonathan Eaton and Miriam Platzi will talk about the challenges they have to face while preserving the old walls of a former political prison and forced labor camp in north central Albania and their efforts to de develop the site and establish a museum. You can ask questions during the webinar through our chat and we will forward them to our speakers. Soon after the webinar, you will find the video on our YouTube channel where you can also watch all the previous videos and all the previous webinars. But now I give the word to Jonathan Eaton and Miriam Lati. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear us. This is Miriam Blatty speaking, and here is my colleague Jonathan Eaton. Hello. We are very glad to be having this opportunity to speak together about our work. And thank you very much to everyone that found some time to listen to us. And I see we have representatives from different countries already, and that is very, very nice for us. Um, we both work for the, an NGO called Cultural Heritage Without Borders that is dedicated to rescuing and preserving tangible and intangible cultural heritage afflicted by conflict, neglect, or human and natural disasters. Our vision is that everyone is able to exercise the right to enjoy, have access, and participate in cultural heritage. We have been working for more than 20 years in the Balkans and as well other areas of the world. And we work with cultural heritage as an active force for reconciliation, peace building, and social and economical development. This webinar will be about our the process we are currently working on which consists in turning a museum into, uh, into a museum of former communist prison and forced labor camp that is called SPACH and is located in Albania. Through this webinar, we will be able to uh, tell you more about the context of the site, but as well to speak together about the techniques we have been using. And as you may wonder from the title, we have based our practice on the dialogue uh, um, concept. And as well, later on, we will be able to tell you to which results this dialogue-based approach uh, led to and also to discuss with you on our current challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead of us um, with the site of SPACH. Um, to start with, I would say that SPACH is a site that reminds us that we humans are capable of the worst as well. Patch is a site that, is, that represents a trauma, not only for those who have been suffering there, but for an entire country that now struggles to deal with its difficult past. In the second half of the 20th century, a harsh Stalinist dictatorship. And yet, today, Albania doesn't have a site that helps society to physically locate the trauma, and a site that ultimately helps society to turn this trauma into resilience. We will be speaking about SPACH as a site as well that represents an example of contested heritage. 
And therefore, in our case, um, um, uh, um, as an example of, uh, let's say, uh, of an example that doesn't lead everyone to agree, for instance, on saving it from its complete destruction or to turn it into a functional site of memory. And even when people do agree, the modalities, the steps, and the finalities are not the same. Therefore, the question that we ask to ourselves all along the process are, are how we can facilitate this process and move forward through the tensions between different situations, interests, and opinions. And for this, we can recommend that the dialogue-based approach is the only way to serve in a sustained way um, a diverse array of social and political goals that are associated to sites like SPAT. But also, we believe that uh, every society, everywhere in the world, has its black spots. Places that remind us of shameful, shameful episodes in the history of a country, or simply put, difficult stories. These places and efforts to work with them can enable people to come together and make civic choices that install restore or sustain democracy and human rights. Also, uh, when you will be hearing from us about this project, you will hear um, a, a typical example of memorialization, the so-called memorialization project. And we feel that it's very important to say right away that the ability for these projects to bring positive change doesn't depend only on the goals of the supposed end product, but they, um, the, this positive change will depend very much also from the process through which these places, these memorials are created. And we will uh, make some time to speak about these processes that we have been following so far and the techniques and the tools that we have um, uh, been utilizing. Also, we are very happy that we have so many listeners for this webinar. And we believe that most of you are practitioners researchers or passionate coming from the museum and heritage sectors. We thank you in advance for your comments, questions and thoughts, because we value a lot your expertise and we hope that we will be able as well to integrate uh, some of your feedback in our process since these are uh, all ongoing efforts. When it comes to our site, Spatch, this is one of the typical images you can find about the site. A uh, site that is located in the mountains of northern Albania. Albania is in the Western Balkan region, right at the heart of nowadays Europe. Um, the prism was placed near one of, one of the biggest copper mines in the country, so that prisoners could be used as free working forces and work in the mines under very difficult conditions. For many of the survivors from Spatch, this is, geographically speaking, the westernmost Gulag type of facility. Like I said, located in, in the very heart of Europe, of today's Europe. And it's inter interesting to notice that the site started to work as a prison in 68, at a time, for instance, when France was dealing with the May 68, the famous May 68 riots. Um, in Albania, the harsh communist rule uh, lasted from 1944 to 1990, and out of a 2 million inhabitants population, 43,000 people were imprisoned, sent to internment camps, or executed. That is to say that one out of 50 persons uh, is concerned by this. Practically speaking, every family in the country has um, connections or is relating to persecution phenomena. From 68 to 1990, Spatch functioned as a reclusion space for many intellectuals that were convicted because of their political opinions. As such, Spatch was and still is considered as the cornerstone of the whole system of persecution in communist Albania. But, Despite having been listed as a national monument from 2007, only a little part of the former camp remains today. Um, and that is only one of the main challenges we are trying to address in our uh, work. Firstly, the deterioration of the site. Um, 
Spats has been abandoned from 1990 and since then many buildings have been destroyed. Objects also have been lost and once on site you cannot see but few traces of life in the prison. A major factor for degradation have been the looting of the sites for metals that have been sold for scrap and mostly this has been happening because of the um, the nearby populations which are among the poorest populations in the country nowadays. Um, a second challenge for us is the destructions of, of the destruction of the mines. As I explained before, the raison d'etre of the whole prison was the mining activity. Nowadays, all the galleries where political prisoners have worked as slaves have been destroyed or have auto collapsed because of the abandonment. In addition, the recent decision making from the national institution have excluded the mining area from the protected area of the monument, leaving thus the monument incomplete or partially meaningless. Also, difficulties have risen when recently a private company has started activity, the mining activity in the same places where the, the prisoners used to work until the, the 1990s. Um, lastly, the other big challenge for us was that Spats is also an object of a big paradox because um, everyone agrees in Albania on its importance, uh, but for a long time no one has acted in order to preserve it. And to a large extent, the site remains still the site, an object of heated political and historical discussion and tensions that have prevented further action to safeguard it. In this difficult context, and with the multiplicity of voices and interests on SPAT, we have chosen to base our work on the facilitated dialogue approach. As you may know, dialogue comes from the, the Greek words dia and logos that literally means uh, to be speaking through speech, through words and through reason. As such, dialogue is a mode of communication which invites people with varied experiences and often differing perspectives to engage in open-ended discussions. A process like a dialogue requires participants to move beyond the surface assumptions that inform their beliefs dialogues are very important because they are a knowledge that there are different ways of knowing different ways of experiencing something and a different perception of a subject also one of the other big advantages with this uh, let's say, concept is that dialogues grant equal value to the insights drawn from personal experience and the knowledge gained from study. In our approach, we preferred to pay special attention to the minor voices, namely those of former persecuted persons that are connected to SPACH and local inhabitants and providing them space and um, um, the opportunity to be speaking alongside with the public institutions and the experts when it comes to the future, to discussing the future of the site. Um, this has led to um, encouraging results because overall we have remarked a better understanding of a site, its history and contemporary significances, and this from all the stakeholders involved in the dialogue process. But also it has resulted in better energized, if I may say, stakeholders and potential donors that start to pay attention finally to the, um, to the value of the work with SPACH. And overall, thanks to um, this kind of technique, we have initiated a change in mentality, especially on the level of the govern government institutions, about being more inclusive, of course, but and about the approach of dealing with communist heritage and Albania's difficult history in general. The process, step by step, consisted in a series of workshops with the same group of people that you see here in the slide that were carefully chosen from the very beginning in order to provide a multiplicity of points of view during the dialogues. And the process has consisted in combining 
techniques from the facilitated dialogue to visioning um, techniques as well. Um, with, with this combination of nice elements, we have organized three workshops. Start with a first workshop on a collective documentation and analysis of the site today. Um, a process that consisted in uh, getting to know or to rediscover the site for those that were once in the site or the ones that are working in the government institutions, but also for, for our younger participants, those that are born after the 90s and that practically know nothing at all or just a little about communist Albania and life under communist Albania. Um, we were able to do during this workshop a collective um, discussion and a collective process of sharing memories and impressions, which were then informed um, different uh, practical proposals when it comes to the future of the site. But what was very interesting for this first workshop was to carve a specific space for former persecuted persons and direct witnesses of Latin Spats to speak their voices and to tell their stories about, uh, about the site. Um, actually, uh, an encounter that was very much valued by all the participants and um, um, that prompted the creation of different multiple narratives, actually. Um, then this process helped the participants start to use different techniques like map, mind maps, um, like uh, uh, identification of different uh, stories, places, or corners around the site that have the potential to be memorialized or to be, become part of the different narratives of, for the site. Once this first step of the analysis completed, we proceeded to the second workshop, which involved a bit more of visioning techniques in order to come up collectively with uh, a set of defined values that would um, lead to the, um, the different choices of memorialization. Collectively, again, participants uh, identified keywords and the key uh, state statements for the site in order to come up with the different, let's say, um, um, tools and descriptions for what is a shared vision of the future of the site. It's important to notice once again that once entering in the dialogue uh, uh, stages, every participant or every representative of stakeholder had his or her own opinion about the future of the site. While at this point, at workshop two, at the end of the workshop two, people had somehow a better uh, collective understanding, a better shared, let's say, um, idea of the future of the site. And that led to a further stage, which was to define collectively again, and I'm, I'm insisting on purpose on the, on the word collective. Um, collectively, we defined the key objectives that would then uh, lead to our third and final, which was the coming up with different proposals and concrete steps ahead as, like I told you a bit earlier, one of the biggest weaknesses of the site was for its main stakeholders to take action in order to preserve it. In concrete terms, three main objectives underpin the roadmap that has been uh, uh, shared and discussed for SPATCH. Firstly, speaking education, interpretation, and public engagement as a way for the site to deploy its potential beyond its physical location and to impact the overall system in Albania. Secondly, uh, the focus was on buildings and infrastructure as a way to provide safer visiting conditions and improved understanding of the site, its people, and its stories. Thirdly, the emphasis was put on the, um, in, um, the legal framework, the management, and the strategic approach with the aim of providing a clearer framework for the establishment in situ of an institution of national and international relevance and the investment needed for this to become a reality. This action plan that was collectively discussed, agreed and coordinated uh, has been serving as a roadmap to very different stakeholders 
in order to coordinate their efforts for SPACH. For instance, um, after the conclusion of the, of the action plan, one of the partnering organizations for the first time installed interpretation panels on site to help guide the almost 3,000 visitors a year that are visiting the site already. While for us at CSWB, uh, we were able to uh, comply with some of the recommendations from the action plan by uh, completing the first in situ interventions for uh, consolidation works at, in order to preserve uh, the, the remaining buildings. Um, an intervention that was needed, actually it was the first intervention of this kind, of this kind for more than two decades. In parallel to these first interventions that you can see here in the images, we used again a dialogue-based approach to engage with future key audiences of the site. And at this point, I'm giving the floor to Jonathan for more insights on the continuation of this process. Thank you, Marianne. So um, what I wanted to highlight before getting into the, the next section, which is kind of bringing us up to the present in terms of this process, um, was that this one of the first things that Mirion said, which is that uh, positive change depends on the process as much as the end goal. And you know, this is what we're trying to really highlight here is that we, in a way, the outcome for this site, the idea that it would be a museum in some form was set back in 2007, but that didn't help anything uh, happen or, or actually occur on the ground there. And so what we wanted to do is, is okay, we have uh, this sort of general goal in mind that something should, should happen on that site. It's an important site. But we didn't want to set in stone exactly what that would be because we wanted to have the chance to develop that along with a very broad, diverse group of stakeholders um, so that actually what comes out of that process is then owned jointly um, by all of us. It's not something that we've just created and imposed on that site but something that we've done together. So uh, I'm going to go into, oh, I discovered I'm not completely in the video. Here we go. Center myself a little here. Um, so I'm going to go into the, the next stage here. Um, as as Mirian was mentioning, once we came up with this joint action plan, we started following some of the steps of that. Um, and, and one of the ways for us to really get into uh, much greater depth of understanding as far as what the needs are on that site and then how to really implement some of these, these, these next steps in, in terms of uh, making the site safe for visitors, in terms of interpreting it for them, um, was to try to do a couple of in-depth focus group sessions. And so I'm just going to describe that process briefly. Um, we have... Uh, so far, we've done a total of six. Um, each session involved uh, three parts, basically. Um, each group went uh, with us and a guide and had a tour of the site given by someone who uh, knows it intimately, was either um, a child there during that period living in the neighboring villages or was a former prisoner uh, who was a political prisoner in Spodge. Uh, and they had a, a tour through their eyes this um, before and after was accompanied by a questionnaire to kind of uh, see what, what their thoughts were um, in a sort of uh, quantitative way in terms of the, the tour, their impressions of the site. Um, but then the meat of this activity was really uh, a long, uh, somewhere around, around an hour, uh, up to an hour and a half maximum, so not too long, but, but a longer in-depth discussion. And, and the idea there was to go really into detail, okay, you know, what, you know, the idea was that, that these people that came on this focus group would not have been there before. They were, they were getting the, their first impressions of this site that many of them had heard of uh, in various ways. Um, and then seeing, okay, what, what do you feel is needed here? How did you feel at this site? And, and then trying to use those impressions to guide what the main messages and the main directions of the site would be. Um, when it's developed further. So of these six groups, we tried to again get a, a diverse number of backgrounds and opinions, but also people that, that we felt would have specific either professional or personal interest in this site as such. Um, so our first uh, focus group session was with a group of history teachers, um, primarily from high schools, 
coming from different parts of Albania. Um, they are, of course, interested in, in the site as a possible place where they could take their, their students that are in high school um, and thinking about how to teach this very difficult part of history through relevant physical examples. Another group was foreign tourists. Many times in Albania, a lot of sites are developed primarily for foreign tourists. We did not want this to be the case with Spotch, but we were acknowledging, of course, that foreign tourists would be a very large part of the audience group and in, at Spot Prison. And, uh, and of course, um, for Albania, um, for, for those coming from Western Europe, you know, who grew up during the Cold War when Albania was a closed country, uh, there are a lot of people that, that are curious about the country's communist period history and, and want to learn more about that. Uh, another group was museum professionals, so ones who, people who have experience in a variety of different institutions around the country um, and can share their professional expertise. Another group was tour operators, people who lead tours both for foreigners, also for, for locals, um, who can kind of give this eye of, okay, what's needed in terms of how groups might, might make their way through the site, uh, what's needed in terms of services and safety. Um, and then the other two groups were, were both with university students. And, and we wanted to have two groups with, with university students, partially because those are also people, um, all of them, that had been born since 1990 and have no direct experience with the, the communist period in Albania. And, um, and they actually gave a, a, a really great perspective. Um, one of the groups was from students who are in cultural heritage management, so this is their field in terms of looking at heritage sites and, and thinking what to do, and they, they brought that experience with them. The other group of students came from a very diverse uh, set of backgrounds, um, and their, their perspective was especially one of, okay, you know, someone with coming to this site with no necessarily prior professional interest and no personal knowledge of uh, the communist period in Albania from, you know, from their own life, because they're too young, you know, how do they experience a, a site like Swapped Prison? And so uh, what we learned from that was really, really interesting as far as um, where to go next in terms of, of developing this site. So um, I have a, a couple of the conclusions here. Um, the, the first group of them here I've, I've called Whose Story, Whose Site? And this really gets to, to some of the deeper questions behind this. So when we have uh, a site that, um, that represents a very painful history, both for you know, direct, a direct painful history for the people that experienced it and their family members, but also represents, in a way, the painful histories of families all over the country, whether or not loved ones of theirs were in Spotch, um, but that suffered in other ways under the communist regime. Um, we thought, okay, so, so who is actually, who is being represented at Spotch prison? Whose story is it? And, and what really came out of those focus group discussions very, very, very clearly was that it, it is everyone's, and each person has their own story of persecution, and there are also their own stories of resistance of the people that um, survived it in various ways, of people that, um, whose, whose families did not give up on them despite facing great pressure to do so, um, of others who uh, were actually managing to create literature, poetry, songs, art, um, uh, even in illegal ways during their time in prison, you know, all these stories of resistance that accompany those stories of persecution and suffering. Um, at this site. So, so what we really discovered was that in, in every case, it's the stories that are the most important above all else, and those personal stories, and that it doesn't belong to any one set of personal stories, but, but the multiplicity of them together. And so one, one key conclusion that came out there was that in, in many times when we, when we work with heritage, we're focusing on the physical fabric, and we're focusing on preserving that. And here in Spodge, the idea was that, okay, anything that we do to conserve and preserve the physical fabric of this place, it's, it's secondary to preserving that, those stories. You know, the, the physical place itself, it becomes, as Miriam was mentioning earlier, it becomes this physical and tangible um, moment and, and location where, where these stories can come out and, and can really be felt as something real and lived. 
Um, but the value of the site is in the stories themselves more so than its physical fabric. Um, and so the other thing that's that's really uh, that comes out of that then is this connection to the lived experience. So at that site, um, what people, and this came through the focus groups as well, having that tour with a former prisoner, what people really need to um, experience there is is that direct connection with with a, a witness. And at the moment, there are still living witnesses um, to that period. But of course, as time moves on, um, the direct witnesses will will pass on, and and we need to be very active in collecting and preserving those stories uh, in connection to the site. So this brings us to another really important um, element of, of this, uh, this former prison, which is connecting the past to the present. And this is something that we, all, we feel working with this site, that, that there are definitely legacies um, of the, the previous, uh, of Albania's difficult past today in the country. Um, some of them more obvious, some of them less so. And this site really helps to, really can and should be a way to try to make connections between um, what happened in the past and today. And that's not to say that the same exact thing is happening, but that's to say that even in society today, which is much more open, we still need to be thinking about human rights, thinking about these issues that were, that were very present in the past, and, and uh, teaching and learning how to defend uh, our rights today. And, and we were really impressed that this is something that, even without opting, came up within the focus group sessions. Um, we, of course, have many, many uh, interesting quotes from that time, but I wanted to highlight one in particular, um, which is that one of the university students uh, in one of the focus groups said, she was saying, even in the very harsh conditions of communist Albania, there were courageous people that took the initiative to come out against that regime because their rights were not being respected. Regardless that they were in those conditions, they still believed and had hope. And this gives us the strength today, in the moment that rights are being violated, not to stay silent. And, and this, to us, was really powerful. This is something that, um, just from a very short tour um, and a brief introduction to that site, this is what one of the participants of the focus groups, um, this was her reflection on that experience. And, and this, you know, this showed us um, all of these things in a nutshell. You know, that that it's about the personal stories connected to that place. It's about those stories of resistance as much as it is about persecution, um, and it's about that that connection today. And so, this is a direct giving us the strength today not to stay silent when rights are being violated. And that was very powerful. So through all this, um, that this this has really helped us see. Um, Spotch as a site of conscience and not only a site of memory. And, and I want to kind of tease out a bit the, what kind of I feel this difference is between site of, site of memory and site of conscious, uh, conscience. And this is something also that working with the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, um, which is a, a global network, um, has kind of helped us see how this works as well. So in many ways, a site of memory is a place where that, that has a really, uh, you know, a powerful connection to history, to personal or collective memories. It's a place that tells us that we should not forget, that we should always remember. The difference that we feel with a site of conscience is that it certainly is a place that, that has a deep connection to memory. It's asking us not to forget, but it's taking us one step further. And it's saying, OK, not only should we not forget, but we need to take action. So it's demanding that we take responsibility for resisting oppression. It's demanding that, that instead of just remembering, we also take the next step and, and we act in order to, to guard against oppression and to protect human rights. So we felt that that's a really, that, that is actually what, what the site means to us. And we felt that that was what the site meant um, to those who participated in the, the focus group sessions as well. So what this gave us actually was, okay, for Spotch as a site of conscience, we actually got a twofold mission for the site that came out of that. So one, which, is, which was a very clear thing, even from before the process, um, many felt that it should honor the memory of those who suffered under the harsh conditions of, of the prison. So, so honoring their memory, remembering uh, the suffering and the persecution that happened there. 
The second is, is what we feel really came out of this process, which is uh, to provide visitors with a human-focused civic education that helps them understand how oppression arises in society and impels them to take positive action as individuals and as members of society. So this is taking that next step. Okay, Spotch, we can remember um, and we should honor those who suffered there, but how best can we honor their memory? Uh, and that's to really tell us to be good citizens and to take action to make sure that that kind of oppression doesn't start to creep into society again. So with that, we came up with um, kind of a, a sort of a, a main slogan or a mantra that, that came out of this process, which is that taking action is more than a choice, it is a duty. And this is guiding the, the next steps for the, the site as well. So what we've been able to do actually coming up with, you know, through the whole dialogues pro process that uh, Miriam discussed, and then through this uh, process of focus groups, um, which the consultation is still ongoing, um, but even through what we've managed so far, we've come up with a, a rough sort of concept for the site. So how do we unlock dialogue and this key word again, action, uh, through Spodge Prison? And this follows in many ways the structure that was laid out in the action plan um, that, that came from the dialogues process before. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of these points. There's a lot of them there. But um, you know, the, the basic idea and the sort of the main components is that how do we then um, take this very, very large process, project, this very large process, and, and we respond directly to the needs that were identified on that site and by the people that were coming from very different backgrounds and working with us um, in order to break this into manageable steps and make it a reality. And the key all along has, for us has been that uh, we, we don't want to leave people behind. We want to engage in, with multiple voices throughout. And we want to be able to increase the activity and the visitorship there um, as, we, as we try to build this site up. And so all of these ac actions are geared towards that, towards being able to increase visitorship uh, in a way that supports those main missions for the site. So we have um, improving the visitor experience there through itineraries, through some basic amounts of orientation and interpretation, uh, through safety and security on site, um, establishing needed services. At the moment, there's nothing. There's you know no no toilets or or running water, this sort of thing. So you know sort of basic visitor center, um, um, setting up various. Uh, experiences where people can connect directly to, to first-hand witnesses. And then kind of in this key objective two, which is turning memory into action, this is going more into programs. So okay, how can we then maybe establish a training center for history teachers or, or have a, a, a school on, on memory and human rights? These sorts of activities that can really activate the site uh, for, for this reason, for, for memory and as a site of conscience. So one other, uh, um, yeah, one of the points I want to just go into is just these these different ways that we can sort of um, activate the site and get more and more people experiencing it in, in different sorts of ways. Um, this is actually another quote from from the focus group, the one with foreign tourists talking about um, one of the a young man actually who was only uh, you know a few years old. Um, when his family was living nearby the prison in one of the, the last houses going up to the prison. And, and they saw many prisoners going by, the family members of prisoners going by, and helped, helped them out on their, on their long trek to visit their family members in, in prison. And, uh, and he gave a tour for this group of, of foreign tourists. And uh, one of them remarked that it was remarkable having uh, this man, whose father worked at the prison, who spent his life becoming a witness to give the tour. He was authentic. His life is bearing witness to what his family was involved in, whether by wish or not, during those years. And uh, and this tour is it is very open. And and this is not a person who was a prisoner there, but a person who whose family was touched deeply by that prison and and by what was happening there. Um, and uh, and this shows the power of that of that direct connection. The photo there is actually a one of our university students that was participating in the dialogues. Um, discussing with a former prisoner um, 
uh, who has been very active in telling his story. He, he shares with young people whenever he has the chance. Um, and he is a remarkable person as well. He, uh, he, he harbors no hate in his heart, but he, he just wants to share his story and he wants uh, such things to never happen again. And that's, that's his goal. And so this is really um, something that kind of shaped our view as people coming and working with a lot of different types of heritage sites, many of which are, are sort of beautiful heritage, and we're focusing on this kind of physical preservation of beautiful heritage, you know, this, this very uh, visceral connection to the story of the place was something very strong for us. So, so there's many different ways um, of kind of, uh, you know, looking at this sort of uh, uh, visitor experience on the site. I'm just going to go very briefly. One is, of course, a survivor's tour, uh, talking directly with people who want to share their stories, and many, many people do want to share their stories. Um, the other, of course, is with very little staff on site, perhaps digital media, um, also, you know, ways to, to get people sort of interactive a bit, you know, try to, trying to find and decipher what, what are the things that some of the prisoners were writing on the walls, some of the ways that they kept hope alive, you know, even from listing the names of Italian pop stars um, to, uh, to drawing uh, pictures to kind of uh, marking, tallying the games that they were playing uh, on the walls. So different ways of really kind of bringing the site to life for, for visitors. So with that, i um, just like to highlight a couple of conclusions. We're drawing really close to the, the end of our, our talk. Of course, we can, we're very, very happy to continue and staying a few minutes and answering any questions you might have. But um, just to go through some of the things that we've learned so far, um, Spot Prison is uh, still very much facing uh, the challenges that it has been facing. We're in the midst of the process now. What we've shared with you are, are, is our uh, approach and our experience until now, but it's very much something ongoing. And so from your perspective, I'm sure that we can learn uh, many things as well as we, as we go on. And I hope that you will follow the process and, and see where we, we can end up with this uh, at the end. So first of the conclusions we wanted to share is um, this idea of engaging early and often with a wide range of actors. So as Miriam pointed out through the dialogues process, we had this, um, these, these different stakeholders and different actors coming from very different uh, perspectives, different points of view, different parts of the country, different socioeconomic strata, uh, different uh, education and background. And, and that has really enriched the process a lot. Um, it's been important to continue engaging with them as well and follow up. And, and to make sure that once they're in that process, if they want to stay involved, which many of them do, then, then they are given the opportunity to continually stay involved. The second thing is, is divine, defining the vision very carefully. And, and what I mean by carefully is, is mostly in, in full consultation and cooperation with the people that you've been working with. And, um, and this means that also to allow it to be flexible and, and to keep in mind that the process is the key here and that, and that following this process that is as open as possible and as inclusive as possible is going to give the best possible result in terms of a site that can feel owned by everyone and, and in service of um, that, that key mission. The other thing is the small steps are key. So, you know, in terms of listening, enabling participation, making connections, um, there, this, this is really, again, it's in the process. And so what, the more that, that you can engage on a one-to-one -one basis with those people that really care about that site, the better. Um, and again, it's not about just opening a museum on site, um, but it's about that process of getting there together. Um, the, set, the second to last thing here, commemoration is insufficient. Civic engagement is necessary. Um, and, and we've seen in, in many cases, OK, well, what is, is needed is certainly commemoration, is certainly remembering these, these stories of suffering, but that's not all that society needs in order to heal. Um, and in order to build a better society and a better a democracy, what we need is engagement, civic engagement, and this sense of responsibility as well. And the last thing is um, that this is not only an, an approach for sites of conscience or difficult heritage sites. 
So I'm sure many of you are, are working at museums or you're researchers and you're not dealing with a site that has been a, a former prison or forced labor camp or, or anything like that. I'm sure some of you are. Um, but those of you who are not, you should know that, that dialogue and, and working with difficult heritage is, is really something for every, every site and every museum. And um, one thing that, that we've learned is that actually you know, this idea of having a civic mission and, and creating this sense of civic duty in, in visitors is something that can be done actually at, at any place. And these histories um, that are perhaps a bit difficult to tell are something that can be found even in any museum collection as well. So um, this is about uh, all I had to say. Um, I don't know if Miri, you would like to add anything or if anyone had any questions. I would maybe just ask, add that um, for all the process that we follow, we've produced extensive documentation and reports that is all public and then can be found online at our organization's website, cswp.org. And yeah, you can use it. You can um, see if it works for you and for your sites, because these are all elements that uh, uh, are very, very helpful, especially um, in cases that are similar to ours, when we didn't know where to start from. And as we pointed out during the webinar, try dialogue as a starting point. Try to work as uh, early as possible with what are going to be your uh, future key audiences. And that, it, that will lead, I'm sure, to very, very nice results and to acceptable results from a wide array of uh, stakeholders. So this would be one of the very practical, actually, advices we would make based on our experience with Spatch Prison. And thanks to all the people actually that are following us from a bit everywhere. I see from uh, France, Belgium to Russia. So thank you very much. We really hope that this was helpful for you in your work, in your lives, and etc. Yeah, and if you have any other questions even after the seminar, you know, please be Feel free to contact us, uh, as Miran said, and look us up online as well and, and follow where we're going. Now this question here. Who do you pick? Uh, there's one question from Maria. Who, uh, thank you, oh wait. Who do you, how do you pick who will participate in your focus group? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> so the idea, I mean, the, the exact people that, that, we, that were participating, it depended a bit on their interest and how we could, who we could get to help organize together with us. We decided in advance the, the types of backgrounds that we thought might be helpful, for example, history teachers, university students, et cetera. Um, and then once we had decided kind of, okay, these are sort of uh, background groups that we want to be able to focus on, then we looked at ways to to, to make that happen. So for example, with the history teachers one, we work together with the Association of History Teachers uh, in Albania and, and they kind of put out a call and we went together with them. Yeah, and when we first started the dialogues, I guess uh, it was a bit easier to select uh, the, the participants in the dialogues process. And basically the, those participants were those, were those that were excluded from public institutions actually in the making of their concept for SPATS, actually. So it was people that were active intellectuals in promoting the case of SPATS. It was local inhabitants. Unfortunately, um, in Albania nowadays, and I'm guess Albania, I guess Albania is not the only country, but people, local inhabitants are, are most of the time excluded from, from this heritage making processes. And we felt that, that this is very important because they are among the first beneficiaries of, of, of those positive changes and developments. Um, um, and also additionally, we worked with, um, the, we, were, we, we had a very strong age criteria because as we mentioned to you, we have now half of the society which is under 30 years old that doesn't have a direct connection to or direct experience, lived experience of the communist period. And this is crucial for us because we, yeah, the dialogue consists also in combining the different uh, perspectives from people that had lived through that time, and people like nowadays students who barely believe that this was really happening. Sometimes they just refer to those suffering and trauma as pure science fiction. So this is really 
unfortunate, but this is the way things are right now in Albania. We have another question here. What is the state's attitude towards this site? Oh, yeah, that's another very good question. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, this, the site was declared Monument 2007, so 11 years ago. Uh, until now, very few actors actually were able to, 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 to commit and then to do uh, interventions on site that improve the situation there. Uh, as far as I know, only two organizations, uh, a partner organization from Škoda in Albania and us, um, their attitude is positive in the sense that they do not, uh, let's say, uh, hand obstacles to people that want to want to um, um, save spots. But on the other hand, we have some reserves because from a legal point of view, there are so many tools and so many, uh, uh, let's say, um, instruments that can still be used in order to provide this clear framework of intervention for spots. But unfortunately, that is not happening because, because of many questions. Um, first of all, Albanian institutions are poor institutions. When it comes to financial financial commitment, it's a bit difficult. Secondly, there is a problem of um, capacities. Um, these are these questions like spots are relatively new uh, topics of discussion and new let's say new areas of expertise for Albania. Therefore, yeah, we are all kind of struggling to find the best possible approach. Thirdly. Um, as I mentioned to you, a private mining company has started to work in those exact, um, let's say, mines where prisoners were, were working a long time ago. So there is this, let's say, a, a superposition of the economic, immediate economic interest to the long-term cultural interest that benefits actually the, the society and the country. Up to now, in Albania, always the, the short-term gain, financial gain, is always prevailing on uh, cultural, let's say, um, concerns. So, yeah, on many levels, yeah, we would like the institutions to be more more involved and more, you know, acting, but but it's, it's this is the situation we have to deal with. Yeah, thank you, Katarina. That sounds like a very interesting project you're doing in Skopje also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just in a nutshell about the state, I mean, yeah, it's Spotch prison is not a priority, and that's clear. But, um, but at, you know, at least the institutions involved are, are willing to cooperate and, and you know, interested in, in what we're doing. Here is just writing the uh, the website in the chat window for any of you that would like to uh, visit our organization's website as well. So the one on the screen is the uh, small blog that we've been maintaining that tells a bit about Spotch in particular and its uh, and the project that we've been working on there. And then the one that he sent in the chat window just now is the the organization's overall website. Maybe another similarity between this case and other cases that like spots in the world, or at least in, in the Balkans and Eastern Europe. Um, like I said, sometimes it's difficult where to make the step and which, which direction to take. And um, when discussing with uh, a former uh, persecuted persons in spots, and when asking about the complexity of, um, of uh, dealing with sites like spots, she was very frank and he was saying, I believe there is an expression in English which goes uh, like, how do you eat an elephant? Where do you start, actually? And then he was saying, it's simple. You just cut it down to you know pieces that you can handle. And as John mentioned, those smaller, I mean, defining, dividing a bigger problem, complex problem into smaller, more manageable tasks, actually, it's really a very, very helpful way to, to move forward with this kind of project. I don't know if you share the same experience as I seen for this. Maybe we can also add that as future, as next steps for now for SPATCH, we are currently doing a lot of fundraising work to be able to provide that financial support that could help us 
initiate the implementation of the concept that Jonathan mentioned. And we are doing that in different ways, uh, either by uh, answering to call for proposals with different uh, partners all around the globe. We are also um, structuring a, a network of uh, important, let's say, diplomats in Albania that are trying to uh, help us in, in making our messages pass across in a better way, actually, to, to, towards the institutions that are responsible for SPACH. And yeah, it's ongoing process. It's it's uh, also for us very important to keep the site as active as possible. Therefore, we are organizing as much as we can prom promotional activities, bringing uh, groups of interested people on site, continuing with focus groups as a way to you know to provide to to make the the, the site be relevant until we have the the possibility to to start working on. Um, different things, other other things on, on site. Is there any other question? For sure we can keep talking about this for hours and hours, but uh, How do you, Lisa Silva says, how do you deal with opposing views between your participants in the dialogue? Um, I'll be very short about this. And actually, the, the whole essence of dialogue is for the participants in the dialogue to feel in somehow discomfort sometimes, actually, because of the opposing views. So I would say a, a, a successful dialogue discussion is has also entails this kind of awkward moments, but for those awkward moment, awkward moments, um, moderation is very, very useful. And yeah, we managed somehow to you know to make discussions constructive, although there were opposing views. And it's there are definitely techniques and tools actually that that can be used for effective moderation. And through the help of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, we have developed as well a, a toolkit on on how to organize dialogue-based events or activities with a very strong focus on moderation tips and, and techniques. And this is a document as well that you can find online at our website. Yeah, the idea, of course, being that um, yeah, opposing views don't necessarily need to be dealt with in, in the sense that they don't necessarily need to be resolved. They don't need to, to two people with opposing views don't necessarily, through this process, have to agree on a viewpoint, but the key is that they see the other person's viewpoint as valid from that point of view, and that's what you try to work towards with, with dialogue. Do you organize commemoration events? Uh, we, we have not organized commemoration events, but some uh, other organizations have done that. Um, and uh, and so that is something that you know every year there's an event to co to commemorate the revolt of Spach, which happened in 1973 and was one of the major uh, moments of sort of anti-communist revolt uh, and resistance during that period of history. And and so yeah, so there are from time to time um, at at least annually events commemoration events held there. who are the participants of these events. Um, the vast majority comes from people that were either uh, suffering in these uh, prisons or these types of sites, their family members, but more and more we are starting to see young people, journalists, writers that are becoming interested in the, these questions. Dealing with the past, it's a very recent topic for the whole country, and one of the efforts is actually to make this question relevant to all parts of the society and not just the those that are victims basically of the communist uh, terror so yeah these commemoration events and the fact that the interest on them is growing really helps uh, put this question forward and uh, to make this cause relevant for everyone I'm just going to go ahead and write our emails here in the window in case you'd like to contact us.
But so in relation to the commemoration activities, it's very interesting that for, for this kind of sites like Spatch, who are just starting to become, let's say, functional sites of memory, it's always very useful to have during the year events that mark the site in a way. And then this commemoration events is very important because then you draw the attention from important persons, if I may say, from, from the, the, the high up uh, uh, officials of the government to um, foreign donors, to embassies, to you know people that are interested in the cause. So it's very important to have, let's say, a commemoration activity or at least one date, I would say, in the year in order to have this group effect actually coming together for a specific day to commemorate the, the site or its history. Yeah, and this is all related to activating the site. So the more events that, that can be happening there and the greater variety of events, the better. So, um, you know, annual commemorations are one thing, tours with, with school groups are another, and then, you know, the idea being to sort of activate this site through as many different types of activities as possible that all are, you know, appropriate in terms of the commemoration, but also the uh, um, civic uh, civic responsibility. It's also interesting to notice that this kind of sites and work with this kind of sites does not exclude, let's say, the official views or the unofficial views or, or, or thinking about uh, the, the, the activities on this side. So these are powerful enough actually to host different types of activities, different types of approaches. So I wouldn't, I mean, a priori, an official, like in our case, doesn't exclude the official, let's say, uh, discourse of this. Uh, types of sites. Ardit has another interesting question. Are Albanian ready to accept the inconvenient past and the diffi difficult heritage? Um, yeah, another, another great question. I would say that uh, I don't know if they are ready to accept it or not, but I think Albanians are ready not to deny anymore in block what the past was. Uh, I mean, be it for its positive effects or negative effects. So I think it's very important for us as, as society, and I'm speaking as an Albanian, as a young person that has very little, very little uh, like experience of that period. It's for us very important to start considering all the different shades of gray, all the nuances of the discussion, and to, to develop a specific, let's say, critical, you know, attitude towards actually what the information that had been circulating, etc. And the most importantly, like John, Jonathan said, actually it's important for us to acknowledge that we all individually have a kind of a role in, in, into you know, uh, stopping these mechanisms that may lead again to, to the worst possible experiences. So I think that's one of the, the main questions actually to, to deal with when we work with this type of sites. Mm -hmm. take it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Dorena says, do you plan to collaborate with public universities? Um, this is something that we, we have been doing, actually, um, although more directly with the students themselves um, than, so informally, I would say, rather than formally. Um, as an organization, we, we actually have formal collaboration with universities through other programs we have, um, such as the regional restoration camps. Um, but for, for Spotch, we, we've made as you saw in the presentation, we've made a point of really including university students in what we do. And what we would like to do actually is, is do e even more of that. And as we start to implement some of the steps that were in the concept, I think it would be really, really important to have university students as some of the ones implementing those. And in terms of collecting oral histories, in terms of doing research, in terms of um, being a part of creating that site, I think, yeah, universities would be really, really key. And, uh, and in, order, in order also to give uh, relevant experience to, to the next generation of, of professionals that are going to be working with these issues. 
Um, so, so yeah, the answer, I guess, is a bit of, yes, we've been collaborating, but not really so formally, and we would like to do more in the future. Especially this span of activities that um, deal with, uh, um, with activism and, and memory projects, I think this is very crucial. For us, it's very crucial that university students actually help us with those aspects, besides the one that John mentioned. In order to give it really this proactivism and this kind of will for the side to move forward. I think we can only manage that with young students, actually, and young people in general. OK, thank you, everybody. I think we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up with that. Um, like we mentioned, feel free to email us, check out our website, and, uh, and please be in touch if you have any other, any other questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. We hope it was helpful for you.